we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. Welcome to episode 2 of Urgency of Change. This and next week's episode feature Terence Stamp reading selected chapters from the book Commentaries on Living. Upcoming episodes include Krishnamurti in conversation with Jonas Salk, Houston Smith, David Bohm, and Iris Murdoch. This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust, Hampshire, UK. For more information about our activities and programs, including the Krishnamurti Retreat Centre, we are online at kfoundation.org. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. As a charity, we rely on your support to continue to make Krishnamurti's work available and preserve it for future generations. If you enjoy our podcast, please let your friends know about it and consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. The book Commentaries on Living is one of Krishnamurti's most well-known and best-loved. In it, he recalls many of the private conversations with those who came to see him. With encouragement from Aldous Huxley, these meetings were written down by Krishnamurti and published in 1956. Two further volumes were published in 1958 and 1960. Terence Stamp is an Oscar-nominated actor. It was through working with Fellini that he met and became friends with Krishnamurti, who, in Stamp's words, used his presence to pause my thinking. Thank you to the Karina Library in Ojai, California, for these recordings. Chapters included in this episode are Fulfillment, Thought and Love, Simplicity of the Heart, The Self, and Psychological Security. Fulfillment. She was married, but had no children. In the worldly way, she said, she was happy. Money was no problem, and there were cars, good hotels, and wide travel. Her husband was a successful businessman, whose chief interest was to adorn his wife, to see that she was comfortable and had everything she desired. They were both quite young and friendly. She was interested in science and art and had dabbled in religion, but now, she said, the things of the spirit were pushing everything else aside. She was familiar with the teachings of the various religions, but being dissatisfied with their organised efficiency, their rituals and dogmas, she wanted seriously to go in search of real things. She was intensely discontented and had been to teachers in different parts of the world, but nothing had given her lasting satisfaction. Her discontent, she said, did not arise from her having had no children. She had gone into all that pretty thoroughly. Nor was the discontent caused by any social frustrations. She had spent some time with one of the prominent analysts, but there was still this inward ache and emptiness. To seek fulfilment is to invite frustration. There is no fulfilment of the self, but only the strengthening of the self through possessing what it craves for. Possession, at whatever level, makes the self feel potent, rich, active, and this sensation is called fulfilment. But as with all sensations, it soon fades to be replaced by yet another gratification. We are all familiar with this process of replacement or substitution, and it is a game with which most of us are content. There are some, however, who desire a more enduring gratification, one that will last for the whole of one's life, and having found it, they hope never to be disturbed again. 
But there is a constant unconscious fear of disturbance. And subtle forms of resistance are cultivated behind which the mind takes shelter. And so the fear of death is inevitable. Fulfillment and the fear of death are the two sides of one process, the strengthening of the self. After all, fulfillment is complete identification with something, with children, with property, with ideas. Children and property are rather risky, but ideas offer greater safety and security. Words, which are ideas and memories with their sensations, become important, and fulfillment or completeness then becomes the word. There is no self-fulfillment, but only self-perpetuation with its ever-increasing conflicts, antagonisms and miseries. To seek lasting gratification at any level of our being is to bring about confusion and sorrow. For gratification can never be permanent. You may remember an experience which was satisfying, but the experience is dead, and only the memory of it remains. This memory has no life in itself, but life is given to it through your inadequate response to the present. You are living on the dead, as most of us do. Ignorance of the ways of the self leads to illusion. And once caught in the net of illusion, it is extremely hard to break through it. It is difficult to recognize an illusion, for having created it, the mind cannot be aware of it. It must be approached negatively, indirectly. Unless the ways of desire are understood, illusion is inevitable. Understanding comes not through the exertion of the will, but only when the mind is still. The mind cannot be made still, for the maker himself is a product of the mind, of desire. There must be an awareness of this total process, a choice-less awareness. Then only is there a possibility of not breeding illusion. Illusion is very gratifying, and hence our attachment to it. Illusion may bring pain, but this very pain exposes our incompleteness and drives us to be wholly identified with the illusion. Thus, illusion has great significance in our lives. It helps to cover up what is, not externally, but inwardly. This disregard of the inward what is leads to wrong interpretation of what is outwardly, which brings about destruction and misery. The covering up of what is is prompted by fear. Fear can never be overcome by an act of will, for will is the outcome of resistance. Only through passive yet alert awareness is there freedom from fear. Thought and Love Thought with its emotional and sensational content, is not love. Thought invariably denies love. Thought is founded on memory, and love is not memory. When you think about someone you love, that thought is not love. You may recall a friend's habits, manners, idiosyncrasies and think of pleasant or unpleasant incidents in your relationship with that person. But the pictures which thought evokes are not love. By its very nature, thought is separative. The sense of time and space, of separation and sorrow, is born of the process of thought. And it is only when the thought process ceases that there can be love. Thought inevitably breeds the feeling of ownership, that possessiveness which consciously or unconsciously cultivates jealousy. Where jealousy is, obviously love is not, and yet with most people, jealousy is taken as an indication of love. Jealousy is the result of thought. It is a response of the emotional content of thought. When the feeling of Possessing or being possessed is blocked. There is such emptiness that envy takes the place of love. It is because thought plays the role of love 
that all the complications and sorrows arise. If you did not think of another, you would say that you did not love that person. But is it love when you do think of that person? If you did not think of a friend whom you think you love, you would be rather horrified, would you not? If you did not think of a friend who is dead, you would consider yourself disloyal, without love, and so on. You would regard such a state as callous, indifferent, and so you would begin to think of that person. You would have photographs, images made by the hand or by the mind, but thus, to fill your heart with the things of the mind is to leave no room for love. When you are with a friend, you do not think about him. It is only in his absence that thought begins to recreate scenes and experiences that are dead. This revival of the past is called love. So for most of us, love is death, a denial of life. We live with the past, with the dead. Therefore we ourselves are dead, though we call it love. The process of thought ever denies love. It is thought that has emotional complications, not love. Thought is the greatest hindrance to love. Thought creates a division between what is and what should be. And on this division, morality is based. But neither the moral nor the immoral know love. This moral structure, created by the mind to hold social relationships together, is not love but a hardening process, like that of cement. Thought does not lead to love. Thought does not cultivate love. For love cannot be cultivated as a plant in the garden. The very desire to cultivate love is the action of thought. If you are at all aware, you will see what an important part thought plays in your life. Thought obviously has its place, but it is in no way related to love. What is related to thought can be understood by thought, but that which is not related to thought cannot be caught by the mind. You will ask, then what is love? Love is a state of being in which thought is not, but the very definition of love is a process of thought, and so it is not love. We have to understand thought itself and not try to capture love by thought. The denial of thought does not bring about love. There is freedom from thought only when its deep significance is fully understood, and for this, profound self-knowledge is essential, not vain and superficial assertions. Meditation and not repetition. Awareness and not definition reveal the ways of thought. Without being aware and experiencing the ways of thought, love cannot be. Simplicity of the heart. The skies were open and full. There were not the big, wide-winged birds that float so easily from valley to valley, nor even a passing cloud. The trees were still, and the curving folds of the hills were rich in shadow. The eager deer, consumed with curiosity, were watching and suddenly darted away at our approach. Under a bush of the same colour as the earth was a flat-horned toad, bright-eyed and motionless. To the west, the mountains were sharp and clear against the setting sun. Far below was a big house. It had a swimming pool and some people were in it. There was a lovely garden surrounding the house. The place looked prosperous and secluded and had that peculiar atmosphere of the rich. Farther down a dusty road was a small shack in a dry field. Poverty, squalor and toil, even at that distance, were visible. Seen from that height, the two houses were not far apart. Ugliness and beauty were touching each other. Simplicity of the heart is of far greater importance and significance than simplicity of possessions. To be content with a few things is a comparatively easy matter. To renounce comfort 
or to give up smoking and other habits does not indicate simplicity of heart. To put on a loincloth in a world that is taken up with clothes, comforts and distractions does not indicate a free being. There was a man who had given up the world and its ways, but his desires and passions were consuming him. He had put on the robes of a monk, but did not know peace. His eyes were everlastingly seeking, and his mind was riven by his doubts and hopes. Outwardly you discipline and renounce. You chart your course step by step to reach the end. You measure the progress of your achievement according to the standards of virtue, how you have given up this or that, how controlled you are in your behaviour, how tolerant and kind you are, and so on and on. You have learnt the art of concentration, and you withdraw into a forest, a monastery, or a darkened room to meditate. You pass your days in prayer and watchfulness. Outwardly, you have made your life simple, and through this thoughtful and calculated arrangement, you hope to reach the bliss that is not of this world. But is reality reached through external controls and sanctions? Though outward simplicity, the putting aside of comfort, is obviously necessary, will this gesture open the door to reality? To be occupied with comfort and success burdens the mind and the heart, and there must be freedom to travel. But why are we so concerned with this outward gesture? Why are we so eagerly determined to give an outward expression of our intention? Is it the fear of self-deception or what another might say? Why do we wish to convince ourselves of our integrity? Does not this whole problem lie in the desire to be sure, to be convinced of our own importance in becoming? The desire to be is the beginning of complexity. Driven by the ever-increasing desire to be, inwardly and outwardly, we accumulate or renounce, cultivate or deny. Seeing that time steals all things, we cling to the timeless. This struggle to be, positively or negatively, through attachment or detachment, can never be resolved by any outward gesture, discipline or practice. But the understanding of this struggle will bring about, naturally and spontaneously, the freedom from outward and inward accumulation with their conflicts. Reality is not to be reached through detachment. It is unattainable through any means. All means and ends are a form of attachment and they must cease for the being of reality. The Self In the opposite seat sat a man of position and authority. He was well aware of this, for his looks, his gestures, his attitude proclaimed his importance. He was very high up in the government and the people about him were very obsequious. He was saying in a loud voice to somebody that it was outrageous to disturb him about some minor official task. He was rumbling about the doings of his workers and the listeners looked nervous and apprehensive. We were flying far above the clouds, 18,000 feet, and through the gaps in the clouds was the blue sea. When the clouds somewhat opened up, there were the mountains covered with snow the islands and the wide open bays. How far away and how beautiful were the solitary houses and the small villages. A river came down to the sea from the mountains. It flowed past a very large town, smoky and dull, where its waters became polluted, but a little farther on they were again clean and sparkling. A few seats away was an officer in uniform, his chest covered with ribbons, confident and aloof. He belonged to a separate class that exists all over the world. Why is it that we crave to be recognised, to be made much of, to be encouraged? Why is it that we are such snobs? Why is it that we cling to our exclusiveness of name, position, acquisition? Is anonymity degrading, and to be unknown, despicable? Why do we pursue the famous, 
the popular. Why is it that we're not content to be ourselves? Are we frightened and ashamed of what we are? That name, position and acquisition become so all-important? It is curious how strong is the desire to be recognised, to be applauded. In the excitement of a battle, one does incredible things for which one is honoured. One becomes a hero for killing a fellow man. Through privilege, cleverness or capacity and efficiency, one arrives somewhere near the top. Though the top is never the top, for there is always more and more in the intoxication of success. The country or the business is yourself. On you depend the issues. You are the power. Organised religion offers position, prestige and honour. There too you are somebody, a part and important. Or again, you become the disciple of a teacher, of a guru or master. Or you cooperate with them in their work. You are still important. You represent them. You share their responsibility. You give and others receive. Though in their name, you are still the means. You may put on a loincloth or a monk's robe, but it is you who are making the gesture. It is you who are renouncing. In one way or another, subtly or grossly, the self is nourished and sustained. Apart from its antisocial and harmful activities, why has the self to maintain itself. Though we are in turmoil and sorrow with passing pleasures, why does the self cling to outer and inner gratifications, to pursuits that inevitably bring pain and misery? The thirst for positive activity as opposed to negation makes us strive to be. Our striving makes us feel that we are alive, that there is purpose to our lives, that we shall progressively throw off the causes of conflict and sorrow. We feel that if our activity stopped, we would be nothing, we would be lost, life would have no meaning at all. So we keep going in conflict, in confusion, in antagonism. But we are also aware that there is something more, that there is an otherness which is above and beyond all this misery. Thus, We are in constant battle within ourselves. The greater the outward show, the greater the inward poverty. But freedom from this poverty is not the loincloth. The cause of this inward emptiness is the desire to become. And, do what you will, this emptiness can never be filled. You may escape from it in a crude way or with refinement, but It is as near to you as your shadow. You may not want to look into this emptiness, but nevertheless, it is there. The adornments and the renunciations that the self assumes can never cover this inward poverty. By its activities, inner and outer, the self tries to find enrichment, calling it experience, or giving it a different name according to its convenience and gratification. The self can never be anonymous. It may take on a new robe, assume a different name, but identity is its very substance. This identifying process prevents the awareness of its own nature. The cumulative process of identification builds up the self, positively or negatively, and its activity is always self-enclosing, however wide the enclosure. Every effort of the self to be or not to be is a movement away from what it is. Apart from its name, attributes, idiosyncrasies, possessions, what is the self? Is there the I, the self, when its qualities are taken away? It is this fear of being nothing that drives the self into activity. But it is nothing. It is an emptiness. If we are able to face that emptiness, to be with that aching loneliness, then fear altogether disappears and a fundamental transformation takes place. 
For this to happen, there must be the experiencing of that nothingness, which is prevented if there is an experiencer. If there is a desire for the experiencing of that emptiness in order to overcome it, to go above and beyond it, then there is no experiencing. For the self, as an identity, continues. If the experiencer has an experience, there is no longer the state of experiencing. It is the experiencing of what is, without naming it, that brings about freedom from what is. Psychological Security He said he had gone into the question very thoroughly, had read as much as he could of what had been written on the subject, and he was convinced that there were masters in different parts of the world. They did not show themselves physically except to their special disciples, but they were in communication with others through other means. They exerted a beneficent influence and guided the leaders of the world's thought and action, though the leaders themselves were unaware of it. And they brought about revolution and peace. He was convinced, he said, that each continent had a group of masters shaping its destiny and giving it their blessing. He had known several pupils of the masters, at least they had told him they were, he added guardedly. He was entirely earnest and desired more knowledge about the masters. Was it possible to have direct experience, direct contact with them? How still the river was. Two brilliant little kingfishers were flying up and down close to the bank and just above the surface. There were some bees gathering water for their hives and a fisherman's boat lay in the middle of the stream. The trees along the river were thick with leaves and their shadows were heavy and dark. In the fields, the newly planted rice was a vivid green and there were some white rice birds calling. It was a very peaceful scene and it seemed a pity to talk over our petty little problems. The sky was the tender blue of evening. The noisy towns were far away. The village across the river and a winding path went meandering along the bank. A boy was singing in a clear, high voice, which did not disturb the tranquillity of the place. We are an odd people. We wander in search of something in far-off places when it is so close to us. Beauty is ever there, never here. Truth is never in our homes, but in some distant place. We go to the other side of the world to find the master and we are not aware of the servant. We do not understand the common things of life, the everyday struggles and joys, and yet we attempt to grasp the mysterious and the hidden. We do not know ourselves, but we are willing to serve or follow him who promises a reward, a hope, a utopia. As long as we are confused, what we choose must also be confused. We cannot perceive clearly when we are half blind. And what we then see is only partial and so not real. We know all this, and yet our desires, our cravings are so strong that they drive us into illusions and endless miseries. Belief in the Master creates the Master and experience is shaped by belief. Belief in a particular pattern of action or in an ideology does produce what is longed for, but at what cost and at what suffering. If an individual has capacity, then belief becomes a potent thing in his hands, a weapon more dangerous than a gun. For most of us, Belief has greater meaning than actuality. The understanding of what is does not require belief. On the contrary, belief, idea, prejudice is a definite hindrance to understanding. But we prefer our beliefs, our dogmas. They warm us, they promise, they encourage. 
If we understood the way of our beliefs and why we cling to them, one of the major causes of antagonism would disappear. The desire to gain, individually or for a group, leads to ignorance and illusion, to destruction and misery. This desire is not only for more and more physical comforts, but also for power, the power of money, of knowledge, of identification. The craving for more is the beginning of conflict and misery. We try to escape from this misery through every form of self-deception, through suppression, substitution and sublimation, but craving continues, perhaps at a different level. Craving at any level is still conflict and pain. One of the easiest of escapes is the guru, the master. Some escape through a political ideology with its activities, others through the sensation of ritual and discipline, and still others through the master. Then the means of escape become all important, and fear and obstinacy guard the means. Then it does not matter what you are. It is the master who is important. You are important only as a server, whatever that may mean, or as a disciple. To become one of these, you have to do certain things, conform to certain patterns, undergo certain hardships. You are willing to do all this and more, for identification gives pleasure and power. In the name of the Master, pleasure and power have become respectable. You are no longer lonely, confused, lost. You belong to him to the party, to the idea, you are safe. After all, that is what most of us want, to be safe, to be secure. To be lost with the many is a form of psychological security. To be identified with a group or with an idea, secular or spiritual, is to feel safe. That is why most of us cling to nationalism, even though it brings increasing destruction and misery. That is why organized religions has such a strong hold on people, even though it divides and breeds antagonism. The craving for individual or group security brings on destruction, and to be safe psychologically engenders illusion. Our life is illusion and misery, with rare moments of clarity and joy. So anything that promises a haven we eagerly accept. Some see the futility of political utopias and so term religious, which is to find security and hope in masters, in dogmas, in ideas. As belief shapes experience, the masters become an inescapable reality. Once it has experienced the pleasure which identification brings, the mind is firmly entrenched and nothing can shake it. For its criterion is experience. But experience is not reality. Reality cannot be experienced. It is. If the experiencer thinks he experiences reality, then he knows only illusion. All knowledge of reality is illusion. Knowledge or experience must cease for the being of reality. Experience cannot meet reality. Experience shapes knowledge and knowledge bends experience. They must both cease for reality to be.